You are listening to the Keeping It Juicy podcast. Your main squeeze in nutrition. Don't forget to subscribe and click the bell icon on YouTube so you can get notified every Tuesday when we upload a new episode. You can also add us on Facebook and Instagram at Keeping It Juicy Podcast. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Welcome to episode 33. Uh, today we're going to be talking about antioxidants and phytochemicals, uh, but before we do that, I want to have a little bit of a laugh. I'm always down for a laugh. Okay. So here's a joke. What do you call cheese that is sad? Go on. Blue cheese. Okay, I'm leaving. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm okay. Close enough. <laughs> So now that we've gotten uh, our laughs taken care of, let's jump into the new nutrition in the news. And this will kind of lead us into um, an episode that we will do in the future. Um, We're definitely going to do an entire episode on gut health. So that's just such a huge topic. That's why it's been taking us so long to really figure out which direction we want to go with it. Um, But this new nutrition in the news is a study that basically they studied rats to see which bacteria prevented the mice from becoming obese and, you know, what that could potentially mean for us. So the study says researchers at the University of Utah Health have identified a species, a specific class of bacteria from the gut that prevents mice from becoming obese, suggesting that the same microbes may similarly control weight in people. The beneficial bacteria called colostrida, (laughs) are I'm probably butchering that, but basically um, trillions of these bacteria inhibit the intestine and the more of these microorganisms, the less the mice became obese. Um, so it's, it's promising, you know, it's always interesting to learn about how gut it's health kind of, really. Hmm? It's kind of interesting that they already like pinned it down to a specific bacteria. Uh, I mean, at this point, it's just an association. Right. Uh, but it's still interesting that they brought that up. Yeah. And I don't know if that's a specific like genus and species of bacteria or if it's just a entire, um, class or or something so i'm not sure how specific this bacteria actually is it'll be interesting and just something to keep in mind you know rats in studies are literally like rats and what i mean by that is these rats don't have lifestyle behaviors so and they're told exactly what to eat so even though and do they listen to you (laughs) i think so um but keep in mind like don't don't think that oh in a couple years like they're gonna find a way to get this bacteria in human guts and this is gonna be my magic pill to lose weight no there's just an association at this point and there's so many other lifestyle behaviors that are so much more important to the um development or not development of obesity so work on those things first that a lot of things are really always, always come down to lifestyle behaviors, really, no matter what we talk about. Always yeah. nice. And people, like some of you guys might even be tuning in just to get some sort of shortcut advice, but it's always going to come down to It's a collective effort. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's always going to come down to some sort of lifestyle ch- change. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. But yeah. Yeah. Very I thought it was interesting. Mm-hmm. Gut health is a huge topic. And like I said, we will dive into that deeper, but there's just so many different like routes you can go. Like obesity is one. Mental health is one. There's so what just, if you have a fecal transplant? Oh, man. I mean, it's like, yeah, the fecal, fecal transplants are... Do you want to swap fecal matter? No. Okay. No. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> Um, but it's like, you, you could have someone with the most optimal, uh, gut microbiome, but if their habits and lifestyle behaviors suck, 
they can become obese too. Like it's not right. a shortcut. Right. So, so the more you know. <laughs> so, so with that being said, let's kind of dive into the actual substance of the episode. So first of all, let's start, kind of dive into antioxidants. So mm-hmm. basically, let's look at food, like really look at food. And let me just start off by saying, if you think back to organic chemistry, antioxidants inhibit oxidation. And I'm sorry to break it to you, but each time you even take a breath, you are literally creating oxidation and you're already slowly killing yourself. Fun times. (laughs) But but the reason why um, we were talking about antioxidants because antioxidants kind of act like that radical scavenger, that hydrogen donor, Mm -hmm. for you science nerds, Mm -hmm. the electron donor. And it also acts as a peroxide decomposer, singlet, oxygen quencher, enzyme inhibitor, and metal chelating agents. So basically, they soak up and cling on to all the bad stuff that's already floating around in your system. But it's important to keep in mind that everything you do is a chemical reaction. So, right. so you're kind of um, oxidizing as you go about life. So we're dying right now. <laughs> Literally, literally. So antioxidants, yeah, soak up all that bad stuff that comes from those chemical reactions that Mm -hmm. happen from our heart beating, our lungs breathing, and breaking down food. So Mm -hmm. it happens. So so examples of antioxidants that come from outside of the body, some of them you probably know, uh, but some of them you might not have heard of that commonly. So vitamin A and vitamin C, vitamin E, are um, the vitamin antioxidants. And then we have Mm -hmm. beta carotene, lycopene, lutein, uh, selenium, manganese, and zeta-anthin. So those are the main antioxidants that come from outside of the body. And again, all of those, once they're in your body, either donate that electron, um, metal chelating agents, so cling to all of the bad stuff. Right. And then... Basically, what the science says, like after several decades of dietary research and more findings, it ba- they basically suggest that consuming greater amounts of antioxidant-rich foods may help protect against diseases. Again, may. So because of these results, there's been a lot of research on antioxidant supplements, and there's been rigorous trials on those supplements in large numbers of people, and they have not found that high doses of antioxidant supplements actually does actually prevents the disease basically eat your stuff from whole foods antioxidant Mm -hmm. supplements is not going to work out well at all so basically yeah there's just not enough research to support that supplements i mean nothing's going to prevent disease right um, in general so don't bank on your antioxidant supplement like keeping you healthy forever so damn (laughs) (laughs) now we'll dive into the observational and laboratory studies so observational studies basically look at typical eating habits lifestyles and health history of large groups of people who ate more vegetables and fruit so again like not from a supplement like food sources of antioxidants and these people did have um, decreased risk of several different diseases, including heart, uh, cardiovascular disease, stroke, cancer, and cataracts. Um, keep in mind, there's more beneficial compounds in fruits and vegetables than just antioxidants. So that's a confounding variable as well. Um, but it does show that people who ate more fruits and vegetables had lower, um, lower risk of developing those diseases. Observational studies can provide basically ideas about possible relationships between dietary and lifestyle factors. For example, people who eat more antioxidant-rich foods might be more likely to exercise and less likely to smoke just because of a whole lifestyle-encompassing you know, trend. But observational studies can't pick up on on those things. So researchers have also studied antioxidants in laboratory experiments. And these experiments show that antioxidants do interact with free radicals and help stabilize them, preventing uh, further cell damage. 
So with that being said, let's kind of dive into the clinical trials of antioxidants because the results of these research seems very promising. Large long-term studies, many of which were funded by the National Institute of Health, were actually conducted to test whether antioxidant supplements, when taken for periods of at least a few years, could help prevent diseases such as cardiovascular disease and cancer in people. So in these studies, volunteers were randomly assigned to take either an antioxidant or a placebo. So basically an, an identical looking product that did not contain that antioxidant. So the research was conducted in a double blind manner. Neither the study participants nor the investigators knew which product was being taken. And the studies of this type called clinical trials are designed to provide clear answers to specific questions about how this supplement will affect people's health. And among the earliest of these studies were three large NIH-sponsored trials of high-dose supplements of beta-carotene. So if you don't know what beta-carotene is, that's kind of the stuff that goes in carrots. Just hint. Um, in, like their menu. <laughs> yes, they, they literally add in the beta-carotene. But no, it's in carrots naturally. <laughs> um, so... Basically, high doses of beta-carotene alone or in combination with other nutrients. And in these trials, which were completed in the mid-1990s, all of them show that beta-carotene did not protect against cancer or cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. And in one trial, beta-carotene supplements increase the risk of lung cancer in smokers, while in another trial, supplements containing both beta-carotene and vitamin A have the same effects. So... Very weird. So, <laughs> yeah. Right. So now we'll talk about why um, these studies didn't find supplements effective um, or like why they didn't work. So researchers suggest that a diet that's high in fruits and vegetables has other factors that are involved with the decreased disease risk, such as lifestyle choices. If we haven't said that enough. Should be We're going to keep saying it. We're going to keep saying it. Um, so other lifestyle choices will play a part into disease risk as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then another thing is just basically the um, large doses of antioxidants that are typically used in studies. It's going to be different than the amounts found in foods. Right. So typically when they do like double blind studies, it's, it's a pretty large amount because they need to make sure they need to see if it's effective, but right. food won't have it singled out just like that. Mm -hmm. And then going back to just the difference between whole foods and supplements, just the basic difference in chemical composition and food versus supplements will affect, will influence the effect. So for example, there are eight different forms of vitamin E found in foods, mm -hmm. eight different forms. And when you take a supplement, it's going to be only one. And you don't really know which one. So so if you're considering antioxidant supplements, don't. But <laughs> <laughs> That's a bold statement. <laughs> I'm a bold person. But, <laughs> but seriously, do not use antioxidant supplements to replace a healthy diet or conventional medical care if need be or as a reason to postpone even seeing a healthcare provider about a medical problem. So if you do have an age-related macular degeneration, please consult your healthcare provider to determine whether these supplements will actually work or not. Just don't don't play self-doctor. And if you can say... <laughs> don't if, be a Google doctor, basically. WebMD. We got to figure it out. So if you are considering a dietary supplement, first get information on it from reliable sources. So that's number one. And mm -hmm. keep in mind that dietary supplements may interact with certain medications or other supplements and they can actually contain ingredients that aren't listed on the label. Yeah, that's so, a big one. Yeah. So your healthcare provider can advise you of certain ones that you can or cannot take. And especially if you're pregnant or you're nursing a child or if you, you're even considering giving a child a dietary supplement, it's really important to consult your your or the child's healthcare provider mm -hmm. and tell 
all of your health care provider about any complimentary health approaches that you already do use and give them a full picture of what you already do. Because I know mm-hmm. some people go to your doctor and then they don't say everything that they're taking because they don't think supplements is considered medication. Right. So that's very important. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And I just want to add a little bit on there too is Supplements are not regulated by the FDA, so it can literally have anything that they want in it. There are a couple, anything. It could be freaking dirt from the ground, and it's... Rat poison, all that fun stuff. (laughs) They're not regulated by the FDA, which means it could have a little bit of the thing that it says it has, or it could have none, and they could be charging you a ton of money. So if you can get it from food, if you can get your nutrients from food, do that. Some people argue, oh, well, the soil's different. If it's not organic, it doesn't have nutrients. It has nutrients. Oh, my God. It has nutrients. Like, it does, okay? It it, it just does. So eat yep. more if you think that it has less nutrients. No, that's too much. I need a supplement. (laughs) (laughs) Anyways, so food first. That is our number, number, number one suggestion Mm. all the time. Food first. Mm. So now we're going to jump into phytochemicals. And this, in in a way, goes hand in hand with antioxidants. So now what are phytochemicals? Phytochemicals are basically naturally occurring plant chemicals. So phyto means plant in Greek. So phytochemical, plant chemical. Basically, these phytochemicals in plants will provide plants with color, odor, and flavor. So once we eat them, research shows that they can influence the chemical process that occurs like subsequently after we eat them. And it is typically in very helpful ways. Right. So now we're going to go into examples of phytochemicals. Um, there's a lot, so I'm going to kind of skim through this, this chart and we'll put it in the show notes in its entirety. Mm-hmm. Just to anyone out there who's getting their bachelor's right now or nutrition degree, I remember having to memorize this. So, <laughs> like, it's it's important, but... You don't use it much again after that, but it, it's important. So it's a, lot, man. It, it's a lot. It's it's definitely a lot. So the first one is carotenoids. So red, orange, and green is the color that it appears as. So mm-hmm. it's broccoli, carrots, tomatoes, leafy greens, sweet potatoes, winter squash, apricots, cantaloupe, oranges, watermelon, mm-hmm. and these are thought to inhibit cancer growth and work as an antioxidant to help improve immune response. So uh, the next one is flavonoids. And this is apples, citrus fruits, onions, soybeans, and soy products. So tofu, soy milk, edamame. And then coffee and tea has this too. And this is thought to inhibit inflammation and tumor growth which could aid in immunity and boost production of detoxifying enzymes within the body. So the next one is indoles and glucosinolates. So these are your cruciferous vegetables, so broccoli, cabbage, collard greens, kale, cauliflower, and Brussels sprouts. And these may induce detoxification of carcinogens. Um, Carcinogens are cancer-promoting agents. It could be a cleaning product, it could be pollution in the air, lots of things are carcinogens these days. Um, And it could limit the production of cancer-related hormones, uh, block carcinogens, and prevent tumor growth. And then moving on, the next one is inositol. And this is in bran from corn, oats, rice, rye, and and wheat. So if you want going on a low-carb diet, you're missing out. So... (laughs) (laughs) Nuts, soybeans, and soy products, and this is supposed to slow down cell growth and work as an antioxidant as well. And then the next one is isoflavonous, and 
I mean, it's been, this has been in the news a lot and it's commonly associated with soybeans and soy products. So, I mean, I've heard it in the news a lot and this is supposed to inhibit tumor growth, limit production of cancer related hormones and generally work as an antioxidant as well. And then the next one is isotheocyanite. And this is in, this is also in cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, cabbage and stuff like that, that we already talked about. And this is supposed to help with the detoxification of carcinogens as well and supposedly block tumor growth and work as antioxidants. So if you kind of see this trend, biochemicals kind of already work <laughs> as antioxidants as well. Yeah. And, and then the next one is polyphenols. And this is in green tea, which can which I've seen in the news as well, mm-hmm, has mm-hmm. been talked about. Grapes, wine, doesn't mean you should load up on wine, but wine, berries, citrus fruits, apples, whole grains, and peanuts. And this is supposed to help prevent cancer formation, prevent inflammation, and also work as an antioxidant. And <laughs> last but not, not least, the last one is terpenes. And this is found in, in cherries, citrus fruit peel, and rosemary. This may protect cells from becoming cancerous, slow, becoming cancerous, and it's supposed to slow cancer cell growth, strengthen immune function, and limit production of cancer-related hormones, fight viruses, and work as antioxidants. Yeah, so, so if you haven't noticed, um, phytochemicals basically work as antioxidants. Right. And Yes, you've. I've uh, personally, I've heard, um, especially resveratrol. That one's a mm-hmm. polyphenol. They are isolating resveratrol. I don't know if they are actually taking it from uh, grapes or if they are making it in a lab. I don't know which one, but they are turning that into a supplement. So you can take resveratrol supplements, which we'll go, go into a little bit later. But let's go ahead and see what science says about phytochemical. So from laboratory studies, it has shown that phytochemicals have the potential to stimulate the immune system, (laughs) block substances we eat, drink, and breathe from becoming carcinogens, reduce the kind of inflammation that makes cancer growth more likely, I mean, you can tell there's a whole trend on cancer, which we'll go into later, and reduce the kind of inflammation that makes cancer growth more likely, prevent DNA damage and help with DNA repair, reducing the kind of oxidative damage to cells that can actually spark cancer and slow the growth growth rate of cancer cells, trigger damaged cells to commit suicide before they can reproduce. I know that's a dramatic statement, but that literally is what it helps it do. And also to help regulate hormones. So oh, that one kind of came out of left field. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you think about it specifically on the list, I talked about the isoflavones mm-hmm. and soybeans and soy products. They, That's I true. mean, you yeah. already know about the trend with that and estrogen. Yeah. Yeah. So, which might be in another episode. Who knows? <laughs> So now we'll jump into the clinical trials of phytochemicals. So according to the traditional recommendations and experimental studies, numerous medicinal plants have been reported to have an anti-cancer effect. So only a small number have been tested in cancerous patients. So limited evidence exists for the clinical effectiveness for those that already have cancer. Mm -hmm. And regarding uh, some phytochemicals, only beneficial effects on cancer-related symptoms or on quality of life have been reported, but no positive results for the actual like reduction of the tumor, if that makes sense. Right. So based on the research, uh, curcumin, green tea, and resveratrol were the only ones that had strong evidence in supporting anti-cancer effects. So we will have a link to this review in our show notes. You can look at the specific properties listed for each phytochemical because there's a lot and it's a lot of information. Mm -hmm. So there is evidence to suggest that consuming foods rich in phytochemicals may reduce the risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, One meta-analysis found that increasing fruit and vegetable consumption 
um, from fewer than three times per week to more than five times per week was associated with a 17% reduction in risk of developing cardiovascular disease. Another meta-analysis suggested that the risk of coronary heart disease with coronary heart disease would decrease by 4% for each portion per day of fruits and vegetables that were added to the diet. So more fruits and veggies. <laughs> Research does suggest that phytochemical rich foods may directly decrease the risk for type 2 diabetes as well. We did a whole episode on diabetes, so go back and listen to that one. And basically what this does is it reduces inflammation and it helps improve insulin sensitivity and indirectly prevents weight gain. And that is one of the most important factors for developing diabetes. Type 2. <laughs> Hashtag type 2. Okay, <laughs> so let's go on to phytochemical supplements. So phytochemicals are already widely distributed in the food supply, yet because of the lack of an inaccurate of an actual accurate comprehensive database, estimating actual intake recommendations is still difficult. So it's still being researched. Duh. And this is going to affect the research ability to actually determine which level of phytochemical intake is optimal or what level of intake could actually pose a health risk. So one of the major functions of phytochemicals is as well as antioxidants. So however, as with all antioxidant compounds, once, they, once they've carried out the antioxidant function, they actually begin to start oxidizing themselves. So, so too much can be bad. Yes. And that's what research needs to be done. On. Right. Because <laughs> you can so, like adding like fuel to the fire. <laughs> right. Right. And that's why it's kind of tricky when you add in supplements because they're so concentrated versus if we just eat fruits and vegetables from our diet, it's not as concentrated sources and you get sources of extra nutrients and fibers and whatnot that come with it. So the long-term effects of consuming all that phytochemicals in health obviously is still not known and therefore supplements can't be recommended. Well, and Granted, having larger amounts of phytochemicals as supplements is theoretically uh, supposed to pose a risk. The risk of consuming high index are well understood either because of how there's a limited volume of these compounds already found in food. So the lack of accurate information regarding the actual dietary intake is limited too. Mm -hmm. And actually the lack of there's actually a lack of studies on the food themselves as well too. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of complex. I mean, long story short, don't supplement. I mean, we did the same thing for antioxidants. Don't do the same thing for phytochemicals or you will start oxidizing yourself. <laughs> <laughs> More than you already are. Too much O2 is not good. That's why I never understood oxygen bars. I just, I don't know, anything to make money. Right. So that concludes our antioxidant and phytochemical episodes. We do want to close out with a social media shout out, as always. And today it goes to uh, RC Nutrition Consulting 209. And he's a dietetic intern, grad student, and he posts great infographics on just like health related stuff and nutrition information. He posts um, a couple quick like video snippets on, you know, kind of a detailed topic. So go mm -hmm. give him, go check him out, go give him a follow. And yeah, thank you for your support. Thanks guys. So that concludes our episode. We will catch you next time. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Keeping It Juicy podcast. Your main squeeze in nutrition. Don't forget to subscribe so you can join us every Tuesday for a brand new episode. Also, you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at Keeping It Juicy Podcast. We'd love to hear from you, so please leave us a review. Five stars, no less. On whatever platform you're listening to, or send us an email at keepingitjuicypodcast at gmail.com. Or if you have any topics you'd like for us to touch upon, shoot us an email. Until next time, don't do anything that I wouldn't do. 
I have a joke for you. It's it's a it's almost like a a riddle. I have a riddle for you. Hmm. When do you go at red and stop at green? Go on. <laughs> when you're eating watermelon. <laughs> That's good, man. <laughs> We're here all night, folks. <laughs> <laughs>